17 years I worked in the Joe Dandy. It was a good coal. Seams 10 feet thick. Burned clean. Company shut it down around 53. I miss work in the old place. Miss it plenty. Many a ton of coal made its way down the old tipple. If the wind doesn't lay it flat, she'll be standing for some time. Beneath abandoned buildings like these, deep shafts and tunnels were home for countless Montana miners. Well, not the hard rock miners in search of gold, silver, or copper, but instead the coal miner. He brought to Montana and a nation a rich mineral known as coal. Like hard rock miners, they sported many names. Trapper, fire boss, rope rider, mule skinner. Many migrated from Europe. Some were already seasoned miners of coal. They were often lighthearted, Yet they looked to their fellow workers for their safety. They were paid by the ton, coal that fired the family stoves, the industrial smelters, and the steam power of a nation. The coal miners brought to the surface a treasure that changed the ways of a young and spirited America. There were sightings of the black outcroppings near the mouth of the Yellowstone River in Montana. Meriwether Lewis, in 1805, noted in his journals, coal or carbonated wood its appearance still continues i exposed a specimen to fire and found it burnt tolerably well it afforded but little flame or smoke but produced a hot lasting fire the lewis and clark expedition had little knowledge of the billions of tons underlying the vast terrain of montana Men with far more vision than the sparse populace of Montana Territory recognized the real value of coal. Colonel James Chestnut proclaimed, Coal is the signet of civilization. The territory can never advance a peg, not one peg, until coal displaces wood. If coal wasn't suitable for all, it was for the railroads. In 1882, Northern Pacific linked Montana to our nation with a transcontinental route, a route laid out by surveyors seeking nearby coal for the steam giants. As rail lines expanded, coal became a powerful force in Montana. The railroads connected both large and small mines with the newly built smelters, steam-driven machinery, and markets beyond Montana borders. By 1900, coal miners had blasted more than a half million tons from the underground mines, heralding the coal boom in Montana. The gold, copper, and silver drawn from Montana's hard rock mines required the refining smelters of Butte, Anaconda, East Helena, Wicks, and the giant Boston and Montana smelter at Great Falls. Smelters burning coal. Coal and its lucrative markets had worked its way into the hearts of the industrialists. The company bosses were pleased, but no more than many of the immigrants, for they had fled from the hardships of Europe. They had found a humbling task, yet a job allowing men to reap some hope in America. They arrived in America from the British Isles, veterans of the depressed collieries. Lured by promises of good wages, they migrated from the farms and villages, the newcomers looking to the experienced miners as they entered the deep shafts and portals. Many immigrants hoped to return home or work long enough to settle a homestead. 
When the company mines looked to coal, the immigrant and American miners followed. They were accustomed to moving from camp to camp. They were Yugoslavian, Welsh, Italian, Scotch, Finnish. <laughs> Just about any European with a lamp and a pick. They became the soul of the mining towns, towns to rival any rowdy gold camp. And where they worked, a proud and strong community blossomed against the collieries. There were tent towns grasping for identity to the company towns with organized housing, water mains, and electric lights. Communities where families had to rent housing and buy everything, including mining supplies, from company stores. The companies held their grip on both the miners and the land. Among the coal camps, there was Timberline, Storrs, Cokedale, Chimney Rock, and Hoffman in the Bozeman coal fields. Belt, Sand Coulee, Stockett, and Lehigh near Great Falls. The towns of Roundup and Klein straddled the Muscle Shell near Billings. And against the Beartooth Range, Red Lodge, Bear Creek, Carbonado, and Jibo, all coal towns, large and small, made up of strangers seeking a better way of life. There are some that still remember. When we arrived, Mother didn't think much about Bear Creek. She didn't really like it. I think if she'd have had the money, she'd have gone, taken us children, gone right back. But she couldn't do that. And so we just stayed on. But she didn't like the town. She'd been used to being out in the country, but she loved the mountains. And, she, and uh, so Dad worked in the mine, and uh, we stayed on, and we grew up among... There was quite a few languages, a lot of Europeans, you know, the Yugoslavians, Austrians, Germans, Finnish, Scotch, Irish, and uh, they were all real nice people. The coal miners and their families reached for companionship among strangers. The women often shared the daily tasks of raising large families. Many immigrants lived in neighborhoods like Fintown, Little Italy, and Caledonia, becoming part of social groups that quieted the misgivings of a new town and new faces. Ethnic lodges extended cherished customs, languages, and benefits for the family of a deceased miner. Fraternal lodges pulled men together in the spirit of brotherhood and patriotism, often including women and children in their festivities. The celebrations were many among the coal camps. A cry for a parade would draw people together from every ethnic group. Celebrations could be expected on the 4th of July, funerals or Labor Day, and when there was a wedding. There was great consumption of strong drink, a tradition brought from the old country. Its pleasures often drawn from barreled homemade spirits. Saloons were plentiful, where coal dust was hastily washed from a miner's throat. If a man yelled fight, the saloons became perilous grounds. But for most, the men rejoiced among their mining comrades. The miners worked the deep coal mines with tolerance for the long hours. The seasoned miners did not find the underground working place as dangerous as the new man, the miner unfamiliar with the roof falls, the poisonous gas, and the killing explosions. The experienced miners watched over the unseasoned until they knew how to test a roof with a pick or watch for a runaway coal car. About the time a miner became comfortable in his trade, he had to risk becoming unguarded, careless. While some men didn't like working the mines, some favored their trade. Tony Tuss of Lewistown, Montana, was one of those men. <laughs> it kind of grows on you. It, uh, it, uh, nothing else to do around. We didn't have such a big place to farm. We only got 160 acres here, and, and uh, it was a means of living, is uh, mostly. And then, of course, when you get interested in it, why, you, you really liked it, yeah. I, uh, I put in 33 years in these coal mines. A miner had to be systematic about his work. He would undercut the coal face before hand drilling the charge holes. We set up the post first and uh, put the thread bar 
in and your boxing and your drill and then you start drilling and you get the short drill in, the interchange about every two foot. You get a two foot drill in and you put a four foot one in or, and then a six foot and drill a while before the last thing you would do is uh, clean it out. We had a little scraper here. And you would scrape it all out before you put the powder in. Knowing how much blasting powder to use became instinctive. We roll it up and crimp it on one side. That would make your cartridge. Yeah. Pour a little powder in it on the bottom before we put the fuse in. We finish filling the cartridge. Blasting was held back until end of shift. By morning, the dust had settled. The back-breaking task of loading the cars awaited the miners. Coal dust was a deadly hazard. Highly explosive, it could be set off by any open flame or spark. After years of breathing of the dust, a miner was often left with a legacy of black lung, a crippling respiratory disease. As the miners reached deeper for coal, miles of tunnels became harder to ventilate. Pillars of coal were left standing to support the roof, and where the roof was unsound, supports put in place. The company mines were dark until electricity was introduced. At first, a man had only a candle or oil lamp, his eyes becoming accustomed to a small thread of light against the darkness. The horses and unyielding mules were stabled underground, brought to the top only during the summer months. The mules were considered of more value to the company than the safety of a miner. He could always be replaced. Some mules were born and died underground, never seeing the light of day. They had one task, to burden against the heavy coal. I, I, was, I was a mule driver. I worked with, worked with the mules. And along in the afternoon, they'd sometimes get tired. They'd kick you every time they got a chance, then, or fight you, or paw you, or sometimes bite you. They get tired, they didn't want to work anymore. The Waymaster checked the cars for tonnage. At large tipple sites, the coal was dumped and sorted into different sizes. Pea, nut, egg, stoker, lump. Coal for the furnaces of schools and businesses, for the homes and farms, and the hungry steam locomotives. Three transcontinental railroads spanned Montana. The smelters processed the gold, silver, and copper. Businesses thrived, and the domestic use of coal was on the rise. With increasing demands for coal, the miner was pushed to produce more tonnage. Safety was often overlooked. Accidents were common. The miner had to pull back his independence. As a group, they had to make a change in the underground darkness. Prior to 1900, there were few restrictions for the coal companies. Miners commonly worked 12 hours a day, usually six days a week. Children as young as 10 worked underground. The Waymaster often shorted the men of tonnage. There was poor ventilation in the deeper drifts. If there was an accident, the company showed little concern. It was time to pull together, time to overcome their ethnic differences and push for a change with the power of a strike. As early as 1889, influenced by Montana's hard rock miners, the coal miners formed their first union local in Red Lodge 
under the Knights of Labor. By early 1900, many Montana coal miners belonged to the United Mine Workers of America. With state legislation, coal companies finally agreed to regulations protecting the underground miners. The small wagon or pony mines stretching from eastern Montana to the Rockies were worked by a family or group of miners preferring their independence over the company mines. They dug for domestic use, their coal wagons and trucks a common sight in Montana towns. The wagon mines offered a living for a few and cheap fuel for many. It was often nothing more than a hole in the hillside with a small tipple held together with some imagination and Model T parts. But for Poli Janskovich and his brothers, it was more than just a living. Well, the only reason that I could see that I liked it, because I stayed with it for 35 years to tell you the truth about it. But uh, one thing about it, when you work for yourself, you're independent. You ain't don't have to go out begging somebody for a job, or you ain't getting turned down and running all over the country. Here we opened up this little mine and and we stayed with it. And uh, it was uh, we knew we could make a, some sort of a living. Probably wasn't going to get rich, but that was I, I knew I knew we could never get rich in this little bit of coal we had here. But we could always scratch out a living as long as we felt all right. So that's what we did. The independent miners faced many of the same conditions found in the large company mines, the same dangers awaiting an unguarded moment. So all at once, it just sounded like a shot. And here I was, in the dark. They used, were, you were in carbide lights that morning, and all the lights went out except mine. And I finally walked up there, and all I could see was just a big slab of rock in between the props. And uh, it knocked Tony, it, it killed Tony right there on the spot, pushed Frank off to the left side. And I thought he was gone too. I didn't see him anywhere at first. Then pretty soon I spotted him and he wanted to know where Tony was. And I said, Tony's under that rock. So I went and got the machine jacked and jacked him up, jacked the rock up off him. And me and Frank got him out, but he was dead. So we, me and Frank had to pack him out. We, we packed him out and put him in a mine car and, and, and dropped him down the slope. And uh, that was it. Striving for more tonnage and higher profits, the companies mechanized the larger mines. The sounds of equipment became louder, the coal dust thicker. Fewer men were needed and there were new dangers. The greatest threat to underground mining came in 1924, when Northern Pacific Railroad developed a major strip mine in eastern Montana, drastically reducing the cost of mining coal. Many railroads turned to oil for fuel. The domestic use of coal was declining. Natural gas, oil, and electricity taking its place. Although some underground mines continued to operate, many coal miners looked to a new trade, their skills no longer sought by the industrialists. The depression of the 1930s also brought an end to once productive coal mines. The closing of any coal mine was a hard reality for many. When the mine closed, it, well, it saddened me because there was a lot of people. Well, it left me there early in the in November, and out of a job, and and it bothered me because I, I myself and so many others were it just put them out of a job all at once. I hated to see them close. There's so much gone, the tipple and the cables running out of the hoist room and. And the tracks is all taken up. You can just barely tell there was a mine here. Coal has kind of come and went, seems to me like. That sometimes in this country, they don't have much use for coal. And other times, it's been on the boom.
after a long lull, the efforts of the Second World War introduced a major surge in the use of coal. Industry once again looked to the coal miner. Many coal miners were glad to be working again. The mechanized Smith mine at Bear Creek was back to full production with three full shifts working six days a week. It was a Saturday on February 27, 1943, when the full working crew of 77 men were lowered to number three seam. It was a nice, beautiful day, and my husband had gone to work, and my son and daughter had we were just having breakfast and sitting around the table talking, and a friend came in and he said, what happened up at Smith Mine? And we said, we, we didn't know what. He said, well, he heard there's been some kind of a explosion or something. At 9.30 a.m., Tony Planacek, working above ground, saw a dust cloud mushroom from the shaft. Alex Hawthorne, the hoist man, telephoned the surface. There is something wrong down here. I'm getting out. Hawthorne and two other men tried to reach the surface. A hurricane wind of debris and deadly gas fell on the men. They dropped, unconscious. With the news of the explosion in Smith No. 3, rescuers tried to restore power and the ventilation system. During the rescue efforts, 118 men were treated for methane and carbon monoxide poisoning. One rescuer died. Hawthorne and the other two miners were revived when found. But only a few, barricaded deep in number three seam, had time to leave messages. There were several messages left. My husband left me one and 11 o'clock said, Dear Agnes, sorry we had to go this way. And children, please take care of your mother. Love and kisses, Emil. And so that changed all of our lives more or less. Some moved out. And, some, some moved closer to families, that we all just did the best we could and chin up and keep on going. That's the way life is. In the rush to produce coal, 74 miners and a rescuer died. The Smith No. 3 closed. Its remains a reminder of the tragedy, the cause for the disaster still in question today. After the Second World War, several underground mines continued to operate. But by the 1960s, many coal mines had been abandoned. Giant electrical generating plants have now become the major consumers of coal. Strip mining in both Montana and Wyoming produce far more tonnage than the underground mines, with far less men, with far less danger. Modern strip mining methods have replaced the simple working tools of the immigrant miners, tools that offered a means of living and working in a trade that fostered several generations of Montana coal miners. Their methods were often crude, but their only means of extracting the valuable coal. The men who work the underground mines now carry only memories of that fleeting time. There's a there machine on, on tracks. They don't mean to do a track, they got a, a chain. And uh, run any place, so they don't have to have no track for it. And it makes it kind of handy to go around the places when they load cars. They put the cars in on the track, and they, they joy load and pick it up all over the place. I put six feet of powder in an eight foot hole a lot of times to shoot down the coal. And the bigger the chunks we get, the more money we get out of it. The more, the better the company guys liked it. They liked the chunks because that's where they made their money. Well, a goofy he was talking about, and had to have a strong back and a weak mind, I said. 
And that's almost a perfect definition for yeah. it. Just goofy had two wheels on it and a conveyor on it, and they'd push it into place. Why, be one man on each side, and you would shovel as fast as you could. When the coal was loaded, they pull it out and put another one in. And you've done that all day long. I started working in Giffen in May of 1934. I think the biggest part of us all did about that time. There, some of them started a year or two later, but the biggest part of us started on the night shift. The uh, older ones are all dead now. I think George even started on the night shift. Yeah. The era of the underground miner had passed. He saw the company mines spread their giant fingers through the shafts and tunnels. He saw the towns with a spirited people from across an ocean and continent. He saw his sons and brothers work and grow in the darkness. He felt the dangers and the suffering. He supplied his nation through world wars, and he brought to America an industrial might unmatched by any nation. Yet there is little left to remind us of the coal miner and his trade, little left to remind us of his dreams. Though unglamorous, with no promise of rich strikes or instant wealth, the coal miner, whose product literally went up in smoke, moved his nation through an industrial revolution. He deserves his place in our history, if only to remind us of the dignity of his labor. Thank you.